Good morning. I'm Vladimir Shirobrov, a Russian scholar in exile. I'm a historian, the author of the book War on the Eve of Nations, Conflicts and Militaries in Eastern Europe, 1450-1500, and some essays in the historical anthologies on the early modern period. This is my private channel where I talk about some extraordinary, terrific events and people about the historical figures who really judged and changed the history of mankind, first of all, in the early modern period, but who are still a little bit obscure in the shadow of some events that are highlighted by historians. Today, I talk about Knut Posse, a Swedish general who was really the founder of the Swedish re regular standing army, which created the Swedish empire. Normally, historians credit the regular Swedish army to the kings Eric XIV and Gustav Adolphus. However, in fact, the Swedish regular army with its special fighting rush, with its extraordinary fighting technique, with its capability to gain victories was created by Knut Posse. In the last third of the 15th century, the Swedish society rose for the independence against the participation in the Kalmar Union with the Kingdom of Denmark and Norway. This united Scandinavian kingdom wasn't highly cohesive structure. However, the Danish kings who presided over the political structure of all three Scandinavian kingdoms, they imposed the taxation on their subjects, not only in Denmark, but also in Sweden and Norway. And what was more important in this period of time, they started to promote the new German feudal social arrangement, political and military arrangement into their kingdoms, in the kingdom of Denmark, Sweden and Norway. The Swedish society rose against this innovation. Three of the Swedish estates headed this struggle. First of all, against the Kalmar Union rose the Swedish nobility. The Swedish nobility wasn't numerous, only around 1,000 families composed it, and the Swedish noble levy consisted of only around 1,000 heavy armored riders. However, the Swedish nobility became the organizational force behind the Swedish military, cultural and statal expansion into the eastern districts of the Baltic Sea coast, into the territory of nowadays Finland, Karelia, and Baltic states. The Swedish nobility found in Finland after it was conquered the new lands for their estates 
and the new peasantry that could be inserted and exploited in much more strenuous, in much more hard manner, with much more harsh demeanor than the Swedish peasantry, which was freedom oriented. The Swedish nobility didn't want to share the revenues of its military expansion into Finland and other districts around the eastern core of the Baltic shore with the Danish kings. And the Swedish nobility became the first between the Swedish estates which rose against the Kalmar Union. Another state which rose against the Kalmar Union was the Swedish peasantry. The Swedish peasantry was absolutely different from the contemporary peasantry of Germany, with which the Swedish peasantry had much in common, including similar languages and similar understanding of the social relations. However, the teens, the 13th and the 14th century were the period when the German peasantry was highly pressed by its feudal lords. It was insert and it was exploited harshly, violently by the German feudals who in this period became the secluded, separate, upper political and military estate with its force expressed in the heavy armored cavalry. Uh, the Swedish peasantry didn't want that the German feudal order was moved, was imposed on them. They wanted to preserve their freedoms, their communal self-administration and their right to compose and wage war by its own communal militia. This communal militia of the Swedish peasantry was its stunning feature, which differed it from the oppressed German peasantry deprived of the right to wear and to use arms. The Swedish peasantry became the second estate that rose against the Kalmar Union, against the Danish kings who impersonated the Kalmar Union for the Swedish society. At last, the Swedish townsfolk became the third state that marched against the Kalmar Union. The second half of the 15th century became the period in the technical side of the European military history, during which the artillery the guns made of the iron strips forged together to make a barrel was changed to the casted copper barrels. It was important that Sweden was a territory where the main European stock of the copper ore was located and Sweden became the all European supplier of copper, precious and highly in demand metal in this period, in that period of time. Uh, the new copper bourgeoisie of Sweden consisted not only of townsfolk 
who processed the copper ore, but also of the free Swedish peasantry who excavated the copper ore and constructed the melting and casting facilities as well. All three of the main estates of the Swedish feudal society rose against the Kalmar Union. They found their leader in Stensturi the Elder, one of the leading Swedish aristocrats who presided over the liberation movement as the regent of the Swedish kingdom. The Swedish estates didn't dare to change their Danish king as the head of state, but they installed the regent, Stensturi the Elder, as their national leader. But the Swedish kings, the, the Danish king, didn't plan to give up, to give an opportunity for the Swedish state to construct the independent state. And the Swedish king, the Danish king, Christian I, launched uh, the big amphibious expedition against the Swedish rebellion. The Danish troops landed near Stockholm and started to invest it, to siege it. It's necessary to tell that the Danish army of the period was totally different from the Swedish army. The Danish nobility was equally small, equally small to the Swedish nobility. It consisted of a few thousand men who could, who could wage war as uh, in the heavy armored cavalry. However, besides relying on the traditional Scandinavian kinds of troops, the Danish kings relied on the East German kind of troops, especially developed in the uh, Northern Germany, the mercenary troops. The mercenary troops in the Ohio consisted of the famous German pikeman infantry, Landsknechts, and the heavily armed cavalry, Raiders. Raiders and Landsknecht of the Danish kings were the professional troops, not the peasant militia and the feudal levy as the backbone of the Swedish army. And the Danish troops of the mercenary kind were superior over the Swedish troops in their fighting capability. Many times. And uh, they, first of all, uh, they professed the new kind of arms that were an habitual for the Swedish troops, the pikes and the handguns. Uh, the Danish troops, the Danish mercenary Landsknecht had an ability to fight in, a, in the cohesive columns and with their cohesive columns, they dispersed, they defeated the Swedish peasant militia, undoubtedly. When King Christian I landed at Stockholm, he deployed the best troops of his mercenary army against the Swedish traditional host. And he, he pressed hardly, and he defeated the Swedish host. However, 
it was the moment when Knut Posse, the best of history, one of the greatest uh, Swedish generals who are undistinguishedly obscure uh, for the nowadays public, came into action. His first and maybe the most important action for the future of Sweden, for the imperial future of Sweden, was the amphibious charge in the boats from the Stockholm fortress into the rear of the Danish army. When the professional guard, when the best warriors of Sten Sture led by Knut Posse hit into the rear of the Danish army, it soon disintegrated. The cohesive columns of Landsknecht were disorganized by the strike. And it was right the time when the crowds of fierce Swedish peasantry attacked them and annihilated them. And it was the time when the defeated Sw Swedish cavalry rallied and attacked the Danish cavalry of the Danish nobility and mercenary German raiders. The Danish army was completely rooted and the Danish king, Christian I, lost all his tools from the hit of the Swedish ballot. It was the time when the hitting power of the firearms was comparatively low and the Swedish ballot didn't kill the Danish king, but all he, almost all his tools fell out and he virtually lost his job on Sweden. Sweden became independent for almost a third of century. And it was the period of time when the structures, when the institutions of the future soon independent Swedish kingdom, which was growing in very fast manner into the Swedish Baltic Empire were established. And Knut Posse was the man whose exploit in the Battle of Brunkenberg of 1471 established the foundation, the military foundation of the Swedish imperial state. In some of the Swedish chronicles, it was told that uh, during his famous attack into the rear of the Danish army, Knut Posse was killed by the strike of X on his head, that he was transported to Drecht, to Stockholm, and soon buried. However, from the Russian chronicles, from the chronicles of the Novgorodian Republic and Grand Principality of Moscow, we know that this uh, information is wrong. Knut Posse survived. His next uh, appearance, his, his next exploit was uh, conducted in 1495 when the Swedish kingdom under the regent Stensturi the Elder confronted the army of the unified Muscovy of the state that was later named Russia. First of all, 
The Swedish army confronted the army of the Novgorodian territories of the, of the Muscovite state. However, the army which opposed Swedes, the Novgorodian army which opposed Swedes was absolutely different from the Novgorodian army that was habitual for Swedes during last few hundred years. It was the novel army, the army transformed from the Novgorodian urban militia and the levy of the Novgorodian nobility into the professional territorial companies of the, of the horse that were settled on the Novgorodian territories by the Muscovite Grand Prince Ivan III. Another part of this army, of this miraculously new army that created uh, the Muscovite state, that created Russia, was the strong artillery. Artillery was some kind of the Muscovite obsession and due to the mighty artillery, uh, Muscovy achieved the superiority over the armies of its neighbors, including the Swedish army. When in 1495, the Novgorodian army invaded the Swedish Karelia, the Swedish part of Karelia, it consisted of the professional territorial companies of the cavalry and heavy search artillery. Prince Daniel Shenya, Daniel Patrikeev Shenya, one of the best Muscovy commanders of the epoch, led this army. This army was seasoned during uh, the wars against the Lithuanians and the Kazan Khanates. And only a few years before, this army sieged and stormed the mighty fortress of Kazan using the heavy siege artillery and a lot of professional men, professional cavalrymen, who, when dismounted, had high capability to fight with the cold arms. It was the same kind of army that Prince Daniel Shenya brought up at Viborg, the Swedish capital of the western region of Karelia. Viborg was very mighty castle, very, very mighty castle located on the island, but never the fortress that couldn't be token existed. Daniel Shenya, according to the best skills available in this time, encircled the Viborg castle with the siege fortification and placed the siege artillery. During the bombardment, the Muscovite artillery achieved to destroy some walls of the castle that were constructed with uh, not only stones, but also with wood and to damage some of the stone towers of the castle. It was quite possible that the Viborg castle could fail from the Moscow storm. And in this case, all history of the Eastern Baltic could be different. However, when the Muscovite storm columns entered the castle, the 
stunning thunder erupted. This event has this name in the chronicles. In some of the Swedish chronicles, the Viborg thunder. What happened? First, after the Moscow storm columns overran the walls of the castle, they found that inside the endangered parts of the walls, the Swedish garrison constructed another, another position, the retreat position, the position on which it could fell back on and continue the resistance. This position was equipped with a row of guns and it was manned by the Swedish infantry equipped with hand arms. It was the moment when the absolutely new innovational composition of the Swedish garrison of the Viborg castle became clear. It was not the traditional Swedish infantry of the called up peasants. It was the garrison of the professional warriors. Some of them were the German mercenaries and some of them were the Swedish military professionals and both of the kinds of troops, the mercenaries and Swedish professional soldiers were trained to use the advanced firearms. First of all, handguns. The handguns were of the kind of the just introduced a light infantry handgun, much log akebus. With the much log akebus, the Swedish infantry shot onto the advancing Muscovite storm column by salvo. And this salvo stopped the Russian column and the sound of the salvo coincided with the blast of the powder stock in the endangered stone town, stone tower of Viborg, where the garrison of the tower ignited the charge. It was a suicidal exploit, but it stopped the Muscovite storming column. Daniel Shenya could achieve the victory if he, if he could power into the bridge some reinforcements. But he wasn't able to do that because one of the Swedish bullets shot down the leader of the Muscovite reserves, Boyar Plesheyev. The Muscovite assault column was disorganized and retreated. And the Viborg castle held off against the storm and it remained in the Swedish hands. Knut Posse was the commander of the Viborg garrison. His next appearance in the Swedish Muscovite war was even more innovative than when he commanded over the professional standing army of the Viborg Horizon. Just uh, over one year later, after the Muscovite failure at Viborg, the Muscovite fortress of Ivangorod uh, that was located in the middle of the stream of the river Narova uh, on the southern coast of the Finnish Gulf 
just opposite the Livonian fortress of Narva faced the surprising Swedish invasion. The fortress of Ivangorod was constructed under the order of the Muscovite Grand Prince Ivan III to become the staple port for the Muscovite export uh, to Western Europe via the prosperous Baltic trade. Uh, the, um, the fortress of Ivangorod was only in the starting stage of its construction, but around the fortress there was a lot of storage facilities for the goods of Muscovy collected for the Baltic trade. When the chain of the sailing ships entered the river Narova, the Muscovite garrison of Ivangorod was shocked because they didn't expect anything of this kind. And they were much more shocked when the Swedish ships that entered the river Narova formed a line and suddenly opened the gunfire against the Ivangorod fortifications. Probably it was the first time in the history of warfare when the new ability of the ship component of the amphibious forces, the ability of deck to show gunfire was utilized. Until this moment, the landing troops were the main striking force in the amphibious operations. Knut Posse was the leader of the first that opened the new era in the history of amphibious operations, demonstrating that the ships of amphibious operations could be used not only as the transportation vehicles, but also as a directly, immediately strike force. After the bombardment from the ship's decks on the fortifications of Ivangorod, the Swedish fleet disgorged the landing troops that dragged the guns immediately under the walls of the fortress and opened fire against the fortifications. The Ivangorod fortifications were constructed in full and soon they were inflamed and partly destroyed. The Swedish columns stormed the fortress and they were the columns composed again not of the mobilized Swedish peasantry equipped with the light cold steel arms, but they were composed of the German and Swedish mercenaries armed with hand arms. The garrison of Ivangorod lacked uh, the firearms and was disorganized and its leaders fled. The fortress was taken by the Swedish forces and destroyed. The goods that were storaged around were partly spoiled by the Swedish troops and partly burned. The Swedes proposed the fortress of Ivangorod to the Livonian order, but the Livonians went fools 
and they rejected this kind of gift. So Knut Posse ordered his troops to reembark on the ships, and the Swedish fleet departed in the Finnish Gulf of the Baltic Sea, out of the reach of the Muscovy troops from the city of Pskov, who hurried to, to catch with it, to destroy it. The Swedish flotilla and Swedish amphibious forces under Knut Posse were undisputably successful. Knut Posse was one of the beasts of history because he was a general. He was a man who waged war on militaries of the opponents and on the civil population, more than 5,000 inhabitants of uh, Ivangorod and refugees who sheltered in the town from the advancing Swedish troop, troops were killed in the town. However, if we look on the military achievements of Knut Posse, he was undisputably the founder of the Swedish regular army of the kind that drove Sweden into the position of the great power in the 17th century, and that provided to Sweden the military resources to decide uh, the destiny of Germany and some other European states of the first rank during the German 30 years war. And we have to remember and to study the uh, personality and achievements of Knut Posse as the undisputably one of the greatest innovators, not only in Swedish military history, but also in all history of the early modern period. I am Vladimir Shiragoro, a Russian scholar in exile, and this is my private channel where I discuss the extraordinary, terrific persons who made history. Good afternoon.